Hi. OK, you can hear me right. Um, my name is Yuval Turjiman. I work for Red Hat. I'm part of the Overt team. And today, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, kind of the reincarnation of, uh, of Overt Node which is uh, probably going to be uh, as a layered product of uh, Fedora Core OS. So I'm going to give a little bit about a back, uh, background about what uh, Overit is. Probably everybody knows. Um, and uh, more specifically, what Overit node is. Um, so then we're going to go to the evolution of Overit node, where we were like uh, three years ago. Uh, what we're doing today and what we plan to go in the future, um, which is uh, kind of uh, probably CoreOS-based uh, node. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain how we built a CoreOS node uh, with the standard uh, CoreOS tools for building, uh, for building this uh, image and then discuss some of the challenges that we had and how we solved them and some open issues that we still have with the, uh, with the node itself and the um, OS tree and all that. So over it. Um, what is over it? Over it is uh, open, the uh, open source virtualization platform, um, the leading open source virtualization platform and um, more specifically, Overit Node is uh, um, the hypervisor that runs the VMs, right? So an Overit host is a hypervisor. You can just uh, install the Overit bits on any, on any host, basically. But Overit Node is something a little special. Um, you can, uh, it's an image-based image uh, op operating system. And uh, it had some of uh, it had some of uh, um, different layouts from the past until today, um, but basically it's a minimal operating system with overhead bits installed uh, on the image and uh, not requiring anything externally. Uh, so, like I said, uh, there were um, there are uh, different layouts. Uh, there was the legacy uh, the legacy node, which was. Uh, we don't use it anymore, but it was on uh, uh, over it 3.x. And uh, the next generation node was uh, over it 4, or is over it 4. And where we want to go next is uh, something that we're looking at is the Core OS based node. Don't know which version it is, but. <laughs> so, legacy node. Um, I'm going to go re really briefly about this. Um, basically, it was live CD was mounted read-only, uh, ISO, and it had like a live read-write and uh, some persistent paths. Um, some of the drawbacks uh, is that, uh, I mean, some of the benefits are that it was an image-based, right? So you can, uh, whatever you tested is uh, what the customer got or user got, and it was really, uh, it's not really, kind of an immutable, right? Um, some of the drawbacks were like the, the live read-write Mount was that you know you reboot the system and everything disappears. I see some people laughing here, but it's, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, not something that you would expect from uh, from an installed system. Um, okay, um, so like I said, it's uh, it's image based. It was immutable. Um, yeah. And so the maintenance for the uh, some. Other drawbacks were the maintenance, you know, uh, to create a custom installer and to whitelist some files, and like I said, the live read-write, uh, something that is not uh, expected from, from a system that is installed on your, on your hard drive. It looked like something like this, if you can see it. Yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there is the, the live read-write uh, and the, uh, some of the paths there, the, the var log and the data logging data and configuration stuff. And like I said, we're not using it anymore, so it's not really relevant. But we're talking about the evolution of what we're, you know, where we were right now. So, okay, so the next, uh, next generation node, ng node, is what we're using today. And uh, it's based on LVM. So what we do is uh, we compose on the, 
we compose a, a, a squash FS using Lorex. We give it a kickstart, and uh, we deliver it. And okay, we compose a, a squash FS with all the over bits installed and a minimal installation of, of a Fedora or CentOS or L. And we deliver it via an, via YAM or DNF. Um, so when the user does you know DNF update, it would get the entire image, and then the post installation script what it does it's is uh, it would ex get the squash fs extract it create a new lv extract it to that lv and uh, the lv would be uh, read only and then would create a snapshot which is read write and this is the what what we have uh, mounted as our uh, slash as our uh, root directory uh, we also have uh, some uh, state uh, like var should be var is not slash var is not uh, is not something that is on the uh, on the image itself, but it's common to uh, many deployments of uh, of Node. And eventually, uh, a new boot entry would be would be created, and you can switch between you know between two versions of of running nodes. So let's say if we if we booted the system, the new the new upgrade. If we booted the new upgrade and it didn't work, we can just roll back easily to the previous one. Um, so the, benefit, the benefits are almost uh, kind of the same as before. It's image-based, so we can uh, just, uh, you know, we know what we are using because it's all tested and nothing is added on top of it. Um, we have the AB updates, so we can switch between different versions of Node. And like someone says, it's, it just works, right? And so the drawbacks is uh, making it just work is, is not really that easy. Okay, it can be sometimes very complicated. Um, so, for example, some of the issues that we have is when whenever there are Z streams, new Z streams, or package package changes, and um, migrating between. I mean, we we are migrating it slash etc. For example, between the layers. So sometimes slash etc changes stuff like uh, symlinks and stuff like that. And we need to um, to handle these uh, specific cases very. Um, very with delicate care, let's say. Um, also, another thing that we can do is we can just take the post-install scripts that we, we we would like to to run or to execute because it's basically a, a post. Inst I mean, it's an upgrade, right? So we would like to to run those post-installation scripts as in upgrade mode, but we really can't do it because we are creating a new a new layer and we install it like a, it's kind of like a fresh installation but rpm doesn't know that so it's uh, it's tricky so uh, sometimes uh, it can get very uh, there, there there is a lot of uh, maintenance that needs to be done and another issue that we have with uh, with the uh, node ng is since we are using a yum and dnf to deliver this uh, squash fs after we install it to the new layer, we need to kind of do some some nasty hacks to, I mean, to not install over and over again the image, right? So we need to, uh, what we do is we take the image and we just hack the RPM DB and install a, a, pa a package on that new layer so that the next time when you boot to the new layer, when you do a DNF update, you won't get, uh, you won't get another, uh, the same update again. So that's the that's the issues we have uh, with it. It's working. Oh, I didn't have all the okay. That, yeah, I mentioned the image base and all that. Okay, and for, for all this all this uh, all this work inside the post install inside post install for Node ng is uh, used by uh, is driven by a package called image based, which is a package that we man maintain. And the way it looks. The layout of the system is something like this. It's just one. Uh, I have just one layer here, but uh, as you can see, the, it, this is this is a minimal partitioning, right? It doesn't have all the NIST all the NIST partitions, um, so it requires approximately 15, 15 gigs of uh, of uh, disk space. Uh, so the 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 if you see the image based layout. The first, the first LV is the read-only um, uh, layer or volume, and the, the, the one with the plus one is the, re is the read-write, which is mounted on slash. Okay, and then we have slash var and slash boot, which are um, 
common to to all to all uh, layers or to all uh, images yeah so um, the next uh, the next uh, so we were thinking about uh, where we want to go with it and uh, of course uh, Reddit acquired CoreOS so we thought well CoreOS and actually it was Atomic as well um, we're trying to solve the same problems trying to do image-based, uh, server-side, creating the image uh, on the server-side, and then delivering it to the, to the user. Um, so it's basically the same. And, you know, CoreOS is cool, so you know, why not? Um, and RPM OS3, uh, so, yeah, RPM OS3, which was uh, kind of taken from, from Atomic, is, much more, uh, it's, uh, is a much more modern solution than what we are doing. To, <laughs> yeah, to uh, the image based, <laughs> and uh, it's more, much more, but it's much more generic than what we are doing. So over the years, image based became more tightly coupled to over it. So, um, for example, if we have some special uh, special stuff that we need to uh, thanks, uh, to uh, to do while upgrading, like stopping VDSM and stuff like that, VDSM is the basic component of over it node. And then this is something that uh, is integrated inside image base, which is uh, it's not it's not very it's not very nice, but uh, yeah, that's the, the the only solution that we could uh, come up with. Um, another reason for using uh, CoreOS is the large community, like uh, you know CoreOS, Silverblue, and Atomic. And so I, I'm, I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit about how uh, how we build and uh, install. Um, how we build and install the over node core is. So what uh, what we did, well, basically we wanted to use uh, the standard tooling from core is, right? Not uh, trying to compose. The, we can take RPM OS3 and compose something on the on the side, but that's not that's not the right way to do it. There is a, there is a project called core assembler or COSA. That's uh, how they call it. Um, it's a container. Right, yeah, you pull it from Quay and, and you give you give it the configuration repository. So uh, configuration repository will hold all the manifests and all the repo files that are needed to compose the the uh, OS3 commit from this from this uh, um, from this uh, configuration. <laughs> and uh, what we do is we take the overt release RPM, which include which holds all the repo files for overt. And we and we extract we, we take the, the over release we extract the repo files we install them right on, on the on the on the configuration directory and uh, after taking some of the some some config some manifest files and some other configurations from the basic Fedora core OS config um, putting all these two together we compose we compose our own uh, our own um, OS tree image. Uh, RPM OS3 image, and uh, so we, we produce uh, uh, the commit, RPM OS3 commit, and the uh, metal raw bare metal installer. Uh, we would install it just like we would install a normal Fedora core OS. I have a screenshot here. So yeah, that's what the, that's what the installation ISO looks like when you boot it. We did some rebranding here for, for, uh, for Oviret. So you give it, uh, you tell it where to install the install device, the image URL for, um, for, uh, for the metal, uh, for the metal uh, um, image, and the uh, ignition URL. And it's just the same as CoreOS, as normal CoreOS. And eventually, we would add the host to the to over it. It would look something like this. It's a little hard to see, but you know, right there on the bottom, it says uh, CoreOS preview. It's, a, it's, an, it's an old version, but this is the um, picture that I had. And this is another screenshot of uh, after updating the, when, you, when you compose the, uh, the, the commit itself, we create our own uh, commit uh, reference. And uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, so some of the challenges we had, uh, we had to face uh, is, K, is we, we had some issues with KDump. Since CoreOS installs uh, in this, it has like a special boot directory, KDOM couldn't find it. 
Uh, we sent patches to KDAMP to help them uh, support uh, RPM OS3, uh, sorry, uh, Core OS correctly. Um, managing the users and groups. So um, when you give, when we clone the Fedora Core OS config, there is a, a groups and password files that you need to maintain on the server side before you compose. And it didn't really work for us that well. Um, what we end up doing is uh, you, you put uh, like an overlay file which would be installed on the, on the image itself for systemd sys users and that would configure all those uh, users and groups that we need for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the installation. Um, some other issues we had is, uh, is Podman and Docker. I mean, everything was working with Podman great until we moved it to RCI and everything broke because we had to, use, to switch to Docker. So, <laughs> but uh, um, we solved it eventually. And Ignition ver versioning. So, um, yeah, the, the, the issue with Ignition is that, uh, well, the issue with, with Chorus in general, they're moving very fast. They're closely um, aligned with the Fedora cadence kind of really. So whenever they are, if we are trying to, if we're working on over it, for example, for Fedora 30, they're already in Fedora 31. And trying to, uh, trying to maintain, to align the, the versioning of, of Ignition, for example, is kind of, uh, it's kind of problematic. Another issue was uh, um, RPM scriptlets. They can't, I mean, it's a mess, right? And, and permissions and uh, yeah. And, but we solved all these. Some of the open issues that we have is uh, non-standard paths because we can't install like in slash uh, whatever, slash gizmo. Uh, we, had to, uh, we have to rebuild our VDSM which has a non-standard path in it. And we need to, to create a hook for QMU and, uh, to, so, we can be, so we would be able to migrate VMs across uh, different hosts. Uh, another issue is uh, kernel arguments. Um, so over it uses Grabby and we need to use RPM OS 3 uh, because RPM OS 3 can control the kernel arguments. And last but not least, is this a big one? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm one step behind, yeah. Is the uh, Ansible module for RPM OS 3. So we are using uh, Ansible to, uh, to, deploy, to add our hosts, and uh, Ansible is not working nicely with the RPM OS 3 at the moment. We are collaborating with the, uh, the Core S team to, uh, to resolve this issue. Um, and that's about it. If you have any questions. I have a question. Yeah. So, like, compared to the old kind of mode, this seems to be quite uh, stateless. So, does, will this support uh, local storage domains or only shared storage? Um, I, I tested it with shared storage. Um, I don't really know yet what uh, the future holds. Uh, no, it's not GA. <laughs> it's uh, it's working, right? I mean, it's uh, we we build it. We don't build it nightly. It's very hard to follow. Like I said, um, core S team are moving really fast. Uh, it's hard to keep up. Um, what state is it? It's kind of uh, you know, patches are welcome. <laughs> No, well, uh, no, we didn't look at it yet. One thing that, but you, one thing that I forgot to uh, mention is that the uh, one of the reasons for doing this is for you know now with the rise of Kubevirt and all and and running VMs inside the pods, um, people might want to you know move between Overt and Kubevirt. May, maybe I don't know. So like, kind of moving from from, from an Overt node CoreOS to a normal core OS for running containers, uh, or you know, or running VMs with uh, with v inside containers, and maybe it's uh, it's kind of what what uh, one of the motivations for this um, migrating from uh, from over to, from Node NG to um, Node Core OS is something that uh, I didn't I didn't look at yet. How, how generic is this tooling? So is it possible to just 
use CentOS repositories and build this no, new node from CentOS packages instead of Fedora ones that are moving so fast? Uh, good question. By the far side of you, I would rather use CentOS that doesn't move that fast. Right. Yes. Yes. We had a talk. We, we had a discussion uh, about this with the core REST team. I, I'm hoping that we will uh, maybe. We just had a discussion yesterday with Mikhail. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're missing uh, some stuff like ignition and uh, in CentOS, right? Yeah. Uh, what's, um, didn't get the question, sorry. So, uh, the ignition of bootstrapping, up to now, uh, all the nodes are just set it up, uh, dumping the thing into an USB, set right, and setting it up, that's a point. Uh, but now, I, as far as I understand it, at least another host which serves the ignition file the initial system, that's part of the... Yes, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, in large deployments, you would use Kickstart anyway, right? So, yeah. kind of something like that. I'm, I, is that is that the question, or I, I mean, uh, I wasn't following. Okay. Yes. Ah. Okay. Anything else? Nobody is asking about the uh, NIST and film. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, thank you. <laughs>